I'm kind of uh, feeling kind of lost, uh, lost in uh, space and time, uh, lost in space because uh, I did my PhD um, on the other side of the river and uh, was trained in the south of the Charles School of Boston Confucianism. And so my only knowledge of Harvard is as a place of deep metaphysical heresy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kind of uh, feeling lost in time as well because... I can't possibly be old enough to go to a 20th anniversary conference, can I? <laughs> Alas, I've slipped from the 25 to 45 group to the 45 to 65 group, and I haven't found a way of reversing that yet. So. <laughs> uh, well, in my prepared talk, which I know you've all deeply uh, read and ingested, I made uh, three points um, that uh, really emerged from my own study of Taoism and ecology. And the first point, basically, is a way of thinking about nature not so much as an environment, something that exists outside of us, surrounding our bodies, but as a kind of uh, insistence or indwelling or informing power uh, within our bodies. And then the second point that I made was um, to understand a kind of a relationality between the body and the world as a kind of liquid relationality um, undergirded by the fluidity of qi flowing within, the, within and without the body of the individual and the body of the world, and there are kind of important um, ecological consequences that flow from this. But it's the third point that I made that I really want to talk about um, today, and, um, and because I think it has relevance more generally uh, for the study of religion and ecology. But if you have specific, specific questions about China and Taoism, I'm happy to talk about them later on. And I'm going to read out just a little bit of what I wrote and then extend that thought a little bit more. The general approach of Sinology um, has been to theorize China from the perspective of the past rather than the future, to understand China today in terms of the key values and concepts from the classics. This produces an understanding of China as something like a traditional culture seasoned in Confucian values, albeit one whose traditions were ruptured by a modernity imported in part from the West. This historical framework produces a basic set of orienting questions when we think about religion in China, such as how do traditional Chinese values continue to influence modern Chinese society? Or how might traditional Chinese values be relevant for contemporary environmental issues? Or in what sense should we think about China as a nation founded upon a certain kind of cultural civilization that we can trace back to the axial age? But I think that the framework of sustainability has the power to radically transform this mode of scholarly inquiry about history, tradition, and modernity, and the basic cultural pattern of thinking that it inspires. When sustainability becomes the orienting question for thinking about cultures, no longer can we think about cultures as something that derives from the past, or look to the past as its source of origin and its identity. Rather, the basic orienting question or the basic orienting framework must somehow come from the future, from the perspective of an era that doesn't yet exist, but which one hopes will. Sustainability, I think, is a paradigm driven by an unimagined hope for the existence of some future world. And to produce religion from the perspective of sustainability is to produce a radical transformation in how to think about religion in its fundamental relationship to the category of modernity. Gone are the basic historical questions of tradition versus modernity and innovation and history. Gone, too, are the fundamental questions of the relationship of religion to the state, which is the preeminent political ordering produced by modernity. I think both these sets of questions must ultimately be transcended by larger orienting questions of the capacity of cultural frames to produce sustainable modes of living. <laughs> Questions of ecology and economy, not history and tradition, must come to the fore in our thinking about religion and culture. This question of the relationship of cultural traditions to that of sustainability is one that is not immediately obvious within the logic of modernity, and it is not one that traditional scholarship is so organized to grasp. I think that an important task for scholarship that has not yet been fully realized is to theorize Taoism, or all of these uh, traditions that we're considering, from some future perspective of sustainability, to imagine in part how scholars in the future will rewrite the discourse of religious studies 
from the vantage point of this culture of sustainability that doesn't yet exist, and to imagine how cultures and religions will be produced, not from the perspective of a dichotomy between tradition and modernity, <coughs> but from the perspective of a paradigm of sustainability. China is wrestling with three, I think, key cultural dichotomies. The first is that of China versus the West, and how to respond to the overwhelming cultural power of the West, and in particular America, that inspires hundreds of millions of Chinese people to study, live, act, and consume like they see on American television. And we know about that in Canada as well. <laughs> uh, the second concerns the place of religious and cultural traditions in the modern world. China has veered radically between radical iconoclasm on the one hand to the exaltation of Confucius on the other as the icon par excellence of Chinese civilization. And at the moment, China is witnessing an extraordinary renaissance of religious activity that simply doesn't fit in with our standard narratives of modernization. And then the third cultural dichotomy is that of the relationship between the 91% Han majority and the 9% who are the 55 ethnic minority groups, including Tibetans and Uyghurs, who live on the frontiers between the Middle Kingdom and its South and Central Asian neighbors. These relationships are critical also for the successful enrolling of President Xi Jinping's One Belt, One Road, Road economic plan. All of these three problems are produced in part by the ideology of modernity, which necessarily frames certain cultural habits, practices, and values as advanced, and at the same time demands the naming of other cultural habits, practices, and values as backwards. The West is imagined to be more modern than China. Science is imagined to be more modern than religion. The Han people are imagined to be more modern than Tibetans or Uyghurs. As Bruno Latour and countless others have noted, this dichotomous patterning of modernity is precisely the same patterning that produces nature as an object to be theorized scientifically, engineered technologically, and exploited economically. In short, it's these habits of thinking and patterns of culture reinforced ideologically by our systems of education that lie at the heart of our ecological crisis. In the past 20 years of religion and ecology, we've achieved a great deal. But if we're to be successful in the future, we must get out of the narrow straitjacket of religious studies that is, that is defined by battles between religion and theology, insider versus outsider perspectives, how to define religion as a category, whether or not religious studies is a field or a discipline, what the genealogy of the term religion is, and whether religion is a valid category. To be honest, I don't really care about any of those questions of religious studies. What I do care about is how to overcome the dichotomous thinking of modernity that produces religion as a spiritual tradition on the one hand, and at the same time produces nature as a material object on the other hand. I believe our future lies in enacting a new paradigm of scholarship focused on the defining question of the sustainable and equitable flourishing of our planetary community. Religion and ecology is not about religion, nor is it about ecology. It's about the birth of a new mode of thinking through the world in our bodies. Sorry, it's about a new mode of thinking through the world in our bodies and thinking through our bodies in the world. This does not mean that we need one paradigm to rule us all. Several people have mentioned new materialism, which is interesting, but we've had it in China for many thousands of years. And if it's just another ism, I don't really care about that either. The problem is deeper, and we who work in university environments are complicit in it, precisely because of the disciplinary structures that produce and validate ways of knowing that are conducive to this so-called modern constitution, and at the same time are amenable to the disciplining power of neoliberal capitalism. A practical struggle we're all engaged in at some level is that of resh reshaping the disciplinary structures of the university so as to accommodate religion and ecology not as a subfield of religious studies nor as a subfield of environmental humanities but as the birthing of a new paradigm of thought. In particular, I think we have to overcome the notion that many of us and the habit that many of us speak in which is that religions are somehow resources for solving the problem of climate instability or this kind of thing. If that is our focus, then we are not going to get very far. And the field of religion and ecology will remain trapped within existing disciplinary structures, the structures that precisely have to be overcome. Delighted though I am to be here, 
I hope that in another 20 years, it is not the centre for the study of world religions that invites us back, but rather a new, unimagined, but yet hoped for, centre for sustainable futures. Thank you. Thank you.